tell us about the blue wall and the architecture. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. It's been uh, this is my first time to Texas, period, I guess, outside of the, the Houston airport, and to Texas A&M in particular, and so far it's been very nice, and I'm grateful. I'll be here, I guess, through Wednesday midday. So, I mean, I'll, I'll hunt down some of you for conversations, but if any of you would like to talk to me more, after the talk, that's how long I'll be here. Um, the, the, the talk today is based primarily on uh, this paper right here with some technology that arose from the one below it. Um, I should say that that work would not exist if it was not for the collaboration of Andreas Karch and Andy O'Bannon. Uh, Andreas was on this paper, Andy O'Bannon was on this one. And since this paper is about EPR pairs and philosophy, well, it was really inspired by a paper of uh, Juan Malvasena and Lenny Suskind, this one right here, on the ER equals EPR conjecture. If you have not taken a look at it, I, I highly recommend doing so at some point before too long. It's, uh, it's, it's very easy to read, actually. So without any further ado, ado let's begin. Uh, for high energy theorists thinking about EDS CFT, the last year, year and a half or so, has really been a fantastic year for better understanding uh, entanglement, uh, particularly in usual con holographic context. There's been a lot of significant advances. Uh, I've just picked several representative ones and plopped them down on this slide. One of which that you'll be hearing a lot more about next week when Joe comes is the ongoing firewall controversy. Uh, Joe is one of the, he is the P in the AMPS paper that started this off last July. Uh, there's also been a number of other results that stand on their own and are independently interesting. Uh, if you want to calculate entanglement, a fundamental property that we're all used to in quantum mechanics, uh, in EDS CFT, really the only way that people know how to do this so far is through something that's known as entanglement entropy. That, as I understand it, Ji Dong talked about last week while he was here. Uh, do, is the definition of entanglement entropy reasonably familiar to the audience, or should I rehash it? Okay, good. So let's let's give the basic quantum mechanics definition. Um, suppose that your your system, your quantum mechanical system that you're interested in is described by some density matrix, so, and there's some Hilbert space, calligraphic H. And suppose that you can write calligraphic H into uh, a direct sum of two sub-Hilbert spaces. We call them HA and HB. So for instance, in continuum quantum field theory, you can divide space, local quantum field theory, you can divide space into two regions, call them A and B, and label them by states that are localized within those regions. Now, okay, but this is just something you can do in ordinary quantum mechanics. For instance, say you have uh, two spins, you have a two spin system. You can describe that two spin system in terms of the spin degrees of freedom of each spin. That gives you an Hilbert space like this. Now, something that's very natural that you can do is you can construct something that's called a reduced density matrix. Let me label it as row A. Which is just the trace over states in B of row. I think you mean tensor product. Um, yes, I do. Uh, good, so there's the reduced density matrix, and then what the entanglement entropy is, is the von Neumann entropy constructed from that density matrix. So we write that as SBE, S for entropy, EE for entanglement entropy, as trace, row A, on row A. And there are similar generalizations known as Rainy entropies that involve traces of the reduced density matrix to some integer power n. As the entanglement entropy, it's been a subject of intense focus more on the condensed matter side of things over the last uh, several years now. Uh, it shows, I'm still 
I don't think anyone's ever proposed how you could actually measure it in a physical experiment, which is, of course, an obvious deficiency. But that, as we know, doesn't stop people from working on such things. Uh, as far as I understand it, if you want to measure entanglement in the context of ADS-CFT, pretty much the only way you can do it is through computing an entanglement entropy in position space. That is to say, divide up, well, what I said earlier, divide up space into two regions, A and B, and trace over states in B. That's something that people can compute in holography. But really, there's not many other observables that we have that characterize the entanglement of whatever state of in you're interested in. So when I say that it's been a year of entanglement in ADS CFT, what I mean is that, is that it's been a year of progress in understanding the entanglement entropy over there, things like this in a holographic context. So among other things, Malvasena and Iskudin-Lukowitz essentially derived, were, well, were able to derive a formula that people have used for several years now, the so-called Rutaki-Nagi formula that was laid down as a conjecture in 2006 for how to compute this. They showed that that was essentially correct. That was nice, that's something here. Uh, a couple months before that, uh, Tom Faulkner, who's coming here shortly, and Tom Hartman independently showed, well, they were able to derive this, uh, this formula for ADS-3 space times. There's been other things people have done. People have looked at quantum corrections to entangled entropy and holography. Uh, Xi Dong was one of the people talking about this last week. Uh, Tom Faulkner was also on a paper with these culprits laying down a proposal for the general quantum corrections to entangled entropy. There's, okay, there's been a lot of fantastic work that has been done, and surely I could highlight other pieces of work. Uh, the things I'm going to focus on today, though, are, are these, these things on the left-hand side. So, primarily I'm going to talk about the ER equals EPR conjecture, which was one of the more fruitful results that come out of this Years worth of work. This was the Malvasena Suskin proposal I alluded to on the title slide. However, to talk about, I'm going to, well, I'll say a little bit about the firewall controversy, mostly because this controversy is the thing that gave origin to the ER CPR architecture. So, this is my outline for the talk today. I'll just give some introductory comments on firewalls since Joe's coming here to talk about them next week. I won't say too much about them. From there, I'll go on to give some, just a review of EPR correlations in uh, quantum mechanics, since it's fun. And then from there, I'll give a brief summary of the Mount Asina Suskin proposal, why they made their very ambitious claims, and then I'll talk about what I did with Andreas earlier this summer, which was to try to test their claims with some very particular, very concrete systems in holography. Any questions before I go on? Okay, very good. So as I mentioned, uh, this talk, that this whole EPR equals ER business would not exist without uh, a reinvigoration uh, that's taken place over the last year of the black hole information loss paradox. So you may recall statements um, going back to the 70s when this debate was going on very heavenly. The, the more precise version of um, the black hole information loss is considered say a quantum field theory or a quantum theory of gravity in the vicinity of a black hole. Uh, naively, I can uh, throw, well, so the black hole looks to good approximation like a thermal state. It emits Hawking radiation, so on and so forth. However, we know that uh, you could form a black hole from collapse, from taking some pure state of quantum matter, condensing it, self-gravitates, produces a black hole that then evaporates over some long time scale. And this looks to be in contradiction with quantum mechanics. How can a pure state evolve into something that looks like a mixed state? We know that quantum mechanics evolves pure states into pure states. So how can this be? And these arguments went back and forth. They, they culminated in the, the black hole complementarity proposal in the 90s. Uh, but perhaps better still, the, the paradox was settled with ADS CFT around uh, the late 90s or so, I put settled in quotes because it, it's back. Um, insofar as one can, so in theories that, in quantum theories of gravity that have a holographic dual, you can 
build a pure state, well, if the quantum theory of gravity is really equivalent to the to a uh, conformal field theory, to a quantum field theory, then you know that there's no problem with unitarity. That pure states evolve into pure states and all as well. Moreover, the, the process of going from uh, pure state to something that looks like a black hole in the bulk is just the process, the conventional process of thermalization in, in a field theory. Something that we know is, well, it's interesting and it's very rich, but it certainly doesn't violate unitarity or the laws of quantum mechanics. Okay, so there was a reinvigoration of this debate, and since Joe's coming next week, I don't want to say too much about it. Um, the firewall debate has had a habit of burning up papers as well as people that have responded to, to the original proposals, and I, I just don't want to wade into that territory if I can avoid it. Uh, what I will say is that the, the main point of what they do is they derive, um, well, the work that they do appears to show that there's a contradiction between the usual independent assumptions that go into, say, the black hole complementarity proposal, the ways that people solved the information loss paradox back in the 90s. The really basic gist of this is the following. Uh, near a black hole horizon, there's some near horizon degrees of freedom, and they, well, for the, say, for a long-lived black hole near the page time, when half of the black hole has rated away into Hawking radiation that's very far from the black hole, those states, if one just turns the crank on the usual complementarity assumptions, are near maximally entangled with the outgoing radiation that's accessible to very far away observers like us, very far away from a black hole, as well as to an observer that has already, to those states that are accessible inside the horizon by an observer who's already fallen in. So it sounds like that there are degrees of freedom that are near maximally entangled with states far away and states inside, but we know in quantum mechanics that one can only have maximal entanglement between two degrees of freedom, not three. That's a that's a contradiction. So this is this is the essential version of the firewall paradox, and the way that they re they resolve this apparent paradox, this apparent contradiction, is to say that there are no infalling observers at all, that they get burned up do not exist once they cross the horizon. There's two things to be said about this that I'll leave for here. I just don't want to go into technical details in my introduction, so the two things I'll say are that um, what I think Joe is going to talk about next week is a paper that he wrote with Don Maroff uh, earlier this summer, and what they show, I, I think correctly, is that there's really only two options that are left. At, after a year's worth of people thinking about this controversy. And the two options that are left are the following. Uh, either one, there are firewalls, and the arguments that they have in their most recent version of, uh, of their papers apply for large black holes in ADS CFT, i.e. not black holes that can radiate away or things like this, in other words, their arguments appear to apply even for Rindler horizons, or for space that don't have actual horizons at all, which is, to say the least, disturbing. Um, since it means that there, there would be some, some highly non-intuitive uh, physics of quantum gravity even in the vacuum. But what it also means functionally, independent of, of that whole question, you should harass them about that when he comes here, uh, the, the statement that there's something that burns up observers just behind a uh, black hole horizon, we should take a step back and understand what that is. That's a violation of the equivalence principle. Right? A black hole horizon, for a very, very large black hole, the arid region in the space time near the uh, event horizon is typically weakly curved. So one would naively think that semi-classical field theory should be perfectly well valid there near a black hole horizon as for any other place um, in weakly curved spacetime. But the firewall prediction is that this is not the case, that there is something very dramatic and terrifying that happens at the horizon. So option one is to sacrifice the equivalence principle. Option two, as it currently stands, I've talked about observers, and, and you should re 
really ask whenever someone talks about observers and these sort of uh, information loss paradoxes, what on earth do you mean by an observer? What is it that you're, what calculation is it that you're talking about that's giving you an observer? The way that people usually do this, as I understand it, is you identify observers in all these quantum gravity problems with some local Polk operator or some operator that the high precision is local. And the, okay, you can ask how on earth do you do this in the quantum theory of gravity? That's a very good question. But the, the way out, as I understand the firewall paradox now, is that the, the bulk observers that you identify that have fallen in through the, the black hole horizon would be related, they, they wouldn't be well-defined operators on, in their own right in the way that we usually think of quantum mechanical operators, things that just map states into states in a linear fashion. Rather, they would be state-dependent operators. So for instance, if you had a black hole in ABS space-time, so that there's some field theory dual, what that means is that the map from boundary operator data to a local operator inside the horizon would be state-dependent, and would depend on the details of the black hole microstate. Now, state-dependent operators doesn't sound like a very nice thing either for those of us that grew up in quantum mechanics. However, I, I, I'll put my opinion down before Joe's talk, and that is I, I would, this seems perfectly normal, actually, to me in a, in a theory of gravity anyway. Um, I don't understand how to write down local operators, for instance, in the bulk in the ESCFT without uh, to know something about the bulk geometry. But anyway, there's, the, the point of this slide is to say that the debate has made some progress and essentially we're, we're down to these two options. And pretty much everyone that's writing papers about firewalls these days falls into one of these two camps. And the ER equals EPR paper of Mount Singh Asuskin really falls into the second. But the second point that I want to say about firewalls is that really independent of the whole controversy, independent of the black hole information loss paradox, this discussion has been very useful in the following sense. It sparked a lot of very original and thought-provoking work on quantum gravity or the quantum mechanics of black holes in general, uh, including the, this ER equals EPR conjecture. And some of these byproducts of the controversy are subject to testing in and of their own right without wading into the information loss questions. What does ER stand for? Oh, I should have explained that. What? I should have said that. I apologize. I, I probably was not listening. I didn't say it. <laughs> so the fault is mine. Um, EPR, I'll EPR. start with that, is the thing that we all know that it is. It's the einstein podolsky rosen paradox of locality and entanglement in quantum mechanics that's resolved by the fact that the world really is quantum mechanical. And ER is Einstein-Rosen, or short for Einstein-Rosen bridge, a wormhole. And the equal is, as we'll come to see, whatever it has to be so that that makes sense. Okay, that's all I want to say about firewalls. I apologize that that discussion is somewhat scattered. I, I'm, I just really don't want to go into that territory if I can avoid it, but I have to say something. So that's what I'll say. Next bit, I want to talk about this uh, conjecture of Maldusain and Suskin, the CR equals EPR conjecture. So to do that, I need to identify both sides. I need to talk about EPR correlations, and I need to talk about wormholes or einstein rosen bridges. So let me do that presently. As, we, as you may recall, back in the early 20th century, Einstein was very disturbed by quantum entanglement. The basic issue that annoyed him was that if you take two entangled spins and you separate them very far from each other and you make measurements on one, they are correlated with measurements that you perform on the other, even if the measurements are performed at space-like separation. And if you thought about this in terms of communicating information back and forth between the spins, that would look like you had just transmitted information faster than light. Now, he was disturbed by this, and he, he ended up sharpening his discomfort into a paradox with Podolsky and Rosen. And as far as I can tell, the, the statement that they, well, they don't write down a, a paradox per se, 
what they show is that quantum mechanics doesn't respect something that they would that they really wanted to be true, which was the statement of local realism. I don't know about you guys, when I took undergraduate quantum mechanics, uh, we, we didn't talk about local realism or hidden variable theories very much. We were just trying to learn how to compute quantum mechanical observable, so I, I didn't get to learn about this as a result. Well, maybe you guys know what the statement of local realism is. Let, let me refresh it for you. The thing that Einstein wanted to be true was the following. Suppose you have two physical systems, let me call them A and B. They're space-like separated. Then if you had a complete physical description of everything, of A and B, then anything that you measure in A, any action that you perform on A, has to complete, be completely independent of the description of system B. In the context of entanglement, what that would mean is that the, the correlations that you have between your two spins are somehow uh, given to you by some hidden variables in addition to the usual quantum mechanical ones that label your spins. All right, as you probably also know, the EPR paradox was put to the test experimentally by John Bell and Bum, who derived some inequalities that were then later tested experimentally. So let me talk about the Bell inequalities, where the story went from there. My, my story for the next few slides is actually going to follow John Presco's lecture notes on quantum information, which I highly recommend. They were very interesting, very well written. So let's, let's consider a state built out of two spins, spin up, spin down, in the usual way. So it's, there's a one over root two in front, so this state is maximally entangled, if you will. It's a spin one state built out of a spin up and spin down. It's maximally entangled. When people say this, by the way, what they mean is that if you trace over one of the spins in the way that I outlined over there, that the reduced density matrix that you get for the remaining spin is proportional to the identity matrix. That's what it means to be maximally entangled. Well, anyway, given this state, you, you can easily show that given the, the spin operators acting on the one spin, the spin operators acting on the two spin, that if you compute this expectation value, you know, spin of the one, spin of the second, along arbitrary axes n hat and m hat, and hat and m hat are normal vectors, then what you get is just minus their dot product. Or if this is n hat, this is m hat, this is angle theta, then this expectation value is minus cos theta. That allows you, you can use that result to compute the following. Let's define projection operators out of the spins for one and two. So I, I want to, my projection operators are going to tell me, um, they're going to project me only to the part of the state that's spin up along axis n hat, or spin down along n hat. That's what these operators are. That allows you to compute probabilities that you would then go and measure that your one particle has the spin that you want, and also that your second particle has the spin that you want. And you, it's clear then that you can just compute those from the calculation of the, of the spin spin correlation function. And you get 1 quarter minus, times 1 minus cos theta. You can use the same logic to ask what happens if you get opposite spins along, these, along the same axis. And that's one plus cos theta. And that's great because that means if you sum up the probabilities and then you measure the two spins at all, you get one, as we should. Great. So here's the, the setting of the original setting of the bill inequalities. Take all three of your axes to be separated in three directions such that all three have um, cos theta equals one half between all three axes. Well, 1 minus 1 half is 1 half times a half means that you find the probability to be a quarter to have the same spin along uh, at, of spin 1, say the first particle measured along the 1 axis to be the same as the second particle measured along the 2 axes and so forth for any pairs of the 3 axes. So what that means is if you sum up the probabilities that all the spins are the same for all the three of these uh, sets of axes, you get 3 quarters. However, you can show that um, any purely hidden variable system would give you a correlation, the, the probability 
would have to be greater than or equal to one, actually. So the quantum mechanical system gives you less correlation in this instance than you would find classically. And then you can go and, in principle, measure this thing in the lab, find out that you get a number less than one, and verify that quantum mechanics indeed describes the world that we live in. Uh, as a fun side note, the way that people actually do this is, is not to work with spin up and spin down states. They usually use photons. So at my undergraduate institution, actually, they, they had students that did summer projects with this. You can build, uh, it doesn't take that much work, you can build a, an apparatus with, for not that much money that uh, involves entangled photons. So the spin one analog of, of this whole discussion. And you can, you can test the, the violation of Bell's inequalities. Well, they're not called Bell's inequalities in that instance. They're called the CHSH, or there's some improved version, CH74. This is in Klaus, Horn, Schmini, and Holt. This is Klaus and Horn, I think. 74 stands for derived in 1974. So people are very creative in that um, the, the point being that these things are testable using photons. Usually this is how people set the, the best balance. Anyway, the, in testing things this way, the thing that you've demonstrated is that local realism cannot hold. Meaning the, the statement that Einstein wanted to be true back here. The way we take, now one can break this statement in one of two ways. One can break down locality, which is, would say that space-like separated systems really can talk to each other, or one could break down realism and say that the world is quantum mechanical. And the way that we usually respond to the Bell inequalities is to preserve locality at the expense of realism. Say that we live in a local but quantum mechanical world. Now, since for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be interested in quantum field theories and I want to characterize entanglement, I would really like to do that without making reference to an analog of Bell's inequalities for, say, maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. I don't want to conjure up what sort of hidden variable theories would impersonate my favorite quantum field theory. So instead, I would like a much simpler means to characterize entanglement. For me, that's going to be the following. Take any connected um, endpoint function where my operator insertions are all space-like separated. So in the previous discussion, I could consider the connected part of the spin-spin two-point function for the my two spins, provided that they're separated from each other. Now, in a hidden variable theory, you can engineer some classical contribution to this connected two-point function. But in quantum mechanical theories, finding a connected um, endpoint function like this really signals entanglement. It signals quantum mechanical effects. The, the, you know, the field configurations, if you will, in a path integral that contribute to this correlation function are really uh, quantum mechanical ones. Not just uh, So this, this is going to be the object that I'm really going to look at for the rest of this talk. Connected, space-like correlation functions, or um, in the language that you're used to from introductory field theory, uh, these are uh, unordered correlation functions, say. Okay, that's this side out of the way. Let me talk a little bit about this side in the Malvasima Susskind conjecture. So we just talked about EPR correlations, which look horrendously non-local, but they're really not due to quantum mechanics. There is a similar challenge to locality that appears in general relativity. Ordinary general relativity in the form of wormholes or Einstein-Rosen bridges. Now let me give you a function. There's some really fancy uh, geometric definition of a wormhole that I'm not going to use in this talk. Really, for me, what a wormhole means is, is the following statement. Consider two points um, that are space-like separated. And they're in, they're in some geometry where there's essentially two different types of paths that connect between those two points. One that well, has some length, let me call the length of that path, it's geodesic length, length one. And a second class of path, which goes, which is, I represent here, is 
going through a blob that I'm calling an ER bridge, where the ER bridge functionally means that the length of the second trajectory is much, 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 much less than the length of the first. However, the, this region here has the property that I can send a space-like path through it, but I can't send a time-like path through this part of space-time from A to B. That's my functional definition of an Einstein-Rosen bridge. It means that there's paths that I can take from one point to the other that I can never send um, an actual person along, but they do exist in the geometry, and they're very short compared to other paths. So an extreme example of this would be space times that involve regions that are completely costly disconnected from each other, but are connected through a bridge, say through a black hole. This is the context in which uh, Malta, Sain, and Susskind made their sort of their, their strongest arguments, which I'll review presently. So their, their best arguments that they write down are done in the context of ads -CFT. Now I've said that acronym a few times now in this talk, but I haven't said what it is. I, I probably should have done that earlier. Um, does anyone in this room know what ads -CFT is? Have you heard the words enough times in talks, probably? You said you gave us a I can probably I can probably do that one too. No, I would I would claim you can skip it. Okay. Well, great. So ADS CFT relates quantum gravity to CFTs, meaning that I can translate questions about um, quantum theories of gravity into purely field theory questions in certain instances, which can give us a better intuition about, uh, about gravity. So let me do that presently. Let's consider an eternal black hole in global ADS. Global ADS is the geodesic completion of ordinary anti-de-sitter space. Its, um, in, its boundary is time cross a sphere. So in holography, what this means is that um, when you consider asymptotically global ADS solutions of gravity, the corresponding quantum field theory lives on time across a sphere. Very good. And there are black holes that you can write down in, in these space times. And they, they're stable. They live forever, which is why they're called eternal. However, if you and, and, and if you just looked at the, the metric for such a thing, you'd say that there's one asymptotically yes region, one boundary, one quantum field theory, and a black hole. However, if you study that geometry more carefully, you notice that it uh, makes an analytic continuation to something called the Kruskal extension, whose Penrose diagram is given by this. Let me walk you through this if you're less familiar with Penrose diagrams. Um, what this means, this area over here, the right exterior, this is the region that you would have identified as being outside the black hole originally. And this line right here, this is the ADS boundary, R cross, say, S3 for a 4D boundary. And these lines right here are event horizons. These slightly curved lines are past and future singularities that lie inside those horizons. Recall that in the Penrose diagram, that light rays travel along 45 degree angles. This tells you that you can send in light from the boundary, and they'll pass into the interior and eventually get annihilated at the singularity. However, it won't reach this region over here. We walk you through that. So the analytic continuation of this black hole tells you that there's actually an outside region. That's there's another region outside the black hole that is completely costly disconnected from the region that you started with, and moreover, has the same basic features, including a boundary, R cross S3. And if you shoot light rays in from it, they never reach the other asymptotically ADS region. That's actually fantastic from the point of view of uh, quantum field theory, because if, if you you, if you were to look at the black hole geometry, you'd say, oh, you know, I have a black hole, it has a temperature, this looks like I'm studying a dual quantum field theory, it's a non-zero temperature. And you can ask, what sort of apparatus, what sort of technology do we have in quantum field theory to study 
uh, thermal physics. And if you haven't seen it before, there's this whole formalism called the closed time path, or CTP formalism, uh, finite temperature field theory, in which one formally extends the integration contour that appears in, say, the, the path integral from a time segment, that, from a segment that goes from t at minus infinity to infinity, and then deviates in the complex plane and comes back from t equals plus infinity back to t equals minus infinity. What that looks like is that, well, formally, what that looks like then is you have two copies of quantum field theory, and there are, are operators that talk to each other from one theory to the other. So, and you look at this picture and you say, aha, there's the exact same thing. I have two boundaries, two quantum field theories. They can't talk to each other causally, but they can talk to each other along space-like trajectories that separate the two. In other words, the black hole ensemble precisely gives you the thermofield double state, or the CTP state, of the boundary field theory, double field theory. And if you wrote down the state for the double CFT, what you would get is um, something that's extremely entangled. It's not maximally entangled in the sense that I said earlier, but for field theories, this is usually what people mean by maximally entangled. If you trace over one set of degrees of freedom in the CFT, you get something that looks like a thermal density matrix for the other. But really, it's extremely entangled. As I said, the boundaries are constantly disconnected. You can never send a time-like path from one to the other. However, there are space-like trajectories that connect the two. However, they have to cross event horizons. And you, from my functional definition a couple of slides ago, this is this is, tells you that this whole region in between, this is an Einstein-Rosen bridge that connects these two exterior regions of the, line, of the geometry. So what Malvis and Sus can do at this point is they know, aha, this is interesting. I have entanglement between two field theories. They didn't say this, but they were obviously thinking it, I think, when looking at their paper. There are also very large space-like separated correlation functions, large meaning um, in order to have a holographic uh, dual, there has to be a large end parameter lying around. This is the rank of the dual gauge theory. So in that, in that large end parameter, there's very large correlations between the left side and the right side, even though they're constantly disconnected. And so they say, ah, well, let me, uh, let me note this combination, this uh, simultaneous appearance of a wormhole and this entanglement. And they go on to conjecture that these two things always have to appear together. Um, in light of this earlier discussion about space-like correlators, let me point out that if there wasn't this interior region of the geometry, the einstein rosen bridge connecting the two, then one couldn't possibly get these uh, large-end correlators, sorry, these uh, space-like separated correlations between the boundaries. And you know just from grounds on thermal field theory that the, like if you measure unordered correlation functions in CTP thermal field theory, they're non-zero and they're just as big as retarded correlation functions. So in order for ADS-CFT to be correct, you have to get those correlations and that tells you that there has to be some region behind the horizon. And in fact, just as a side comment, these are the only sorts of observables I know of that um, in terms of local operators on the boundary directly probe physics behind the horizon. Okay, they give a more non-trivial example as well, actually. Um, they resurrect some old papers of uh, Garfinkel and Strominger, and then as well Garfinkel, Giddings, and Strominger from the early 90s, which, uh, since I'm young and ignorant, I didn't know anything about, so I found it really interesting when they pointed these solutions out. These describe, in these solutions that these people worked very hard to write down, describe um, essentially the Schwinger pair production of near extremal black holes in an external electric field. If you quick rotate and look in the Euclidean context, that looks like a charged black hole that circulates, it undergoes cyclotron motion in a magnetic field. And what they do is they look at the, the Lorentzian geometry, and there's, there's two black holes and they accelerate away from each other. 
Uh, since they're air produced out of an electric field, they're obviously entangled with each other. And what they notice is that if one looks at the geometry very carefully, you see that there's actually a wormhole that connects the interiors behind both horizons. And so again, one has an identification between entanglement, or at least one sees entanglement and wormholes showing up in the same place. This is essentially the guts of then their conjecture that, uh, if you will, the physics of entanglement is encoded in the appropriate limits and the physics of wormholes. Yes? Is it the smooths of the black holes that are entangled in this example? Or what, is that? what exactly? This is actually a good question. <laughs> what do we mean? So one way uh, of describing this is in terms, say you have some quantum field theory that lives in this background, then certainly the degrees of freedom in this way that are near the event horizon of one black hole, but just outside it, are entangled with the degrees of freedom that are outside the other horizon. That's a good question. The central charges are related, so what, we, we have to back up a step. Um, conformal symmetry relates central charges to entanglement entropy for pure field theories. And I, I'm not sure if any of that then applies to long gravity and black hole backgrounds. Maybe if you take a black hole and say asymptotically yes, so the UV is uh, Well, but we're, you're mixing how to say it, there's um, the entanglement of field theory degrees of freedom, and then there, this is dually represented somehow in terms of entanglement of both degrees of freedom. And the problem that, that uh, Andy was mentioning here was an attempt to identify the bulk entanglement right. degrees of freedom. So what ADS-CFT gives you then is some map. Okay, I, I should say before going on that Navasena and Susskind conjecture, then more broadly, that the physics of entanglement maybe is always encoded in the physics of wormholes, even for, say, a two-spin system. Although what you mean by a wormhole in that instance is very nebulous and uh, ill-defined. They mumble some words about uh, Planckian scale wormholes connecting the two spins, but really I, I don't think anyone knows what, what this means, but the, the observation is interesting nevertheless, and so Andreas and I undertook to, to study this in ADS-CFT. However, there, one of our motivations in doing this is that there's a potential problem that you notice immediately upon hearing their conjecture for the first time, which is that we know of examples, like ordinary quantum mechanics, where there are EPR correlations, there's entanglement, um, in completely non-gravitational theories, theories without any gravity at all. So how can the physics of entanglement or EPR cons uh, possibly be related to the physics of wormholes in such a theory. Well, uh, what we then chose to do was the, the following. Uh, we decided to build something as close to an EPR pair as we could get in ADS-CFT. And uh, since it's all holography, we did it in our favorite non-gravitational quantum field theory that we can study, namely n equals four, and we use holography. And then the second question, of course, is is there some wormhole somewhere? It won't be in the field theory, obviously, because the field theory is a completely non-gravitational quantum field theory, but is there a wormhole that appears somewhere? This leads to the final portion. I should have said this at the outset. What we did in this paper was really very humble. Probably every talk that you'll hear for the rest of this semester is more sophisticated and uh, involved a lot more work than what I'm about to show you. I'll give that disclaimer. Um, so our idea for an EPR pair, 
sort of the most natural thing that you could write down that generalizes two entangled spins is to imagine adding a quark and an anti-quark to n equals four. Four-dimensional, I mean, four S U N superhang Mills theory and the uh, usual holographic limits. So this is large n, and if lambda is the attempt coupling of the superhang Mills, I take lambda to also be very large. Uh, recall that in order to add quarks and any quarks to n equals four, what, what that means in holography is that you add some fundamental strength to the gravity dual. And the gravity dual is given by um, type 2b string theory on the EDS5 cross S5. The EDS5 has a four dimensional boundary, that's where the n equals four lives. And the fundamental string, um, it has two endpoints. And those endpoints, roughly speaking, are dual to the quark and to the anti-quark. Uh, let me remind you that the EDS and the S5 come with a scale. They have a curvature radius, R, that's related. I mean, EDS CFT is a dictionary that maps bulk and field theory parameters, so you can relate R to the string length and to the field theory of tilt coupling in that way. As a result, if you have some string in ADS that has a size comparable to the ADS radius, if it's a macroscopic string, then pretty much everything that you compute from it is going to carry a factor root lambda, which you can just see if the action of the string is going to go roughly like its size, the size of the whole sheet goes, it has to scale like r squared. r squared over alpha prime gives you square root lambda by this. That's going to explain the factors of square root lambda that you see on the next few slides. Okay. In the event that your fundamental string, that the endpoints stretch all the way up to the ADS boundary, then you get uh, external quarks in the n equals four, meaning, if you will, the addition of some supersymmetric Wilson lines. Um, if uh, a second possibility that you can have is that the string endpoints don't end all the way up on the boundary, but instead they end at some intermediate point in EDS, in which case, if you will, they, these are really dynamical quarks, but they have to end on an object. They have to end on a brain. And what I'm going to talk about is actually this, this first case where I inject some external quark in any quark, n equals four. And there's really only two ways of doing this if I have two endpoints. Um, the first way is, is what I kind of implicitly showed on the previous slide. The, I can have one endpoint string joins up to the other, can have a connected string, or I can have two disconnected strings. The strings just fall and never reconnect to each other. And I'm going to consider the connected possibilities. Uh, let me point out that since I have some strongly interacting non-abelian gauge theory goop, and I put some colored external particle in the middle of it, that the yang mills is going to polarize in its presence. I'm going to get some cloud of gluons and other n equals four fields that'll dress my external quark so that the state that I end up getting around one of these string endpoints is really that of some colored quasi particle. And you can ask sort of how many, you know, how many degrees of freedom, roughly speaking, does such a thing have? How would you characterize it with weak coupling intuition? One way of doing that is to compute the thermal entropy of a single one of these quasi particles. I'm just making aside that you can compute that entropy straightforwardly from the bulk, and you find that it's proportional to square root lambda. So in that sense, you, you can think of this quasi-particle as like order root lambda gluons and other n equals four fields surrounding your test quark. Of course, if I connect my string up, then that gives me a color singlet in the boundary theory. And if I don't, then I get some colored state. But the color singlet sort of is obviously entangled. All the color orientations that in my quasi-particle over here are correlated with my color orientations of my quasi-particle over here in such a way that I get the color singlet, which sounds very reminiscent of what you do in conventional quantum mechanics, where to build, say, the simplest EPR pair, you have some um, spin half particle, and you combine it with another spin half particle in order to get a spin singlet. So in some sense, this is like the SUN analog of uh, a spin singlet. 
However, since this is a gauge theory, and spin is not some uh, equal some global symmetry, if I, 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 I actually, the statement is a little bit fraught with peril. There's some, the color singlet kind of obviously looks entangled, but if you want to precisely characterize the entanglement, this is a, a little fishy. The reason for this is the following. Uh, first, over here, when I have spin states, I can meaningfully trace over internal degrees of freedom for one spin by just tracing over spin states. If I have some colored quasi-particle, I just don't know how to do this. I don't know how to trace over the internal degrees of freedom of such a thing. And secondly, um, supposing even that I was able to trace over this, I would get a reduced density matrix that carries color information, color orientation, and I just don't know how to measure that in a gauge invariant way. The analog in the EPR context, if you trace over the spin orientations of one particle, then the reduced density matrix characterizes the spin of the remaining one. That's the manifestly engaged invariant observable. Well, this would not be. Consequently, I don't know how to describe the entanglement for this QQ bar pair in terms of some reduced density matrix. And so we're, we're forced to employ other observables. And oh, what we end up doing actually is looking at position space entanglement entropy because we know how to compute this in holography. We look at a variety of configurations where my quark and any quark they're external particles, so I can pick them along whatever trajectories I want. I have them go on various trajectories, and then I compute entanglement entropies uh, for regions in which, say, one quark is in one region and the other is in the other. Let me point out that unlike uh, the case of spins, there's a priori no crisp connection between the position space entanglement entropy and the usual notion of entanglement in, e in an EPR context. Um, however, our, our results end up suggesting that there's some connection anyway, in the sense that our results are robust, as I'll now describe. At the end of the day, we, we study sufficiently simple solutions that we can, we can calculate things, and, and those solutions really break up into two uh, classes. The, let me point out that since the string is connected, my quark and equark pair are always entangled field theory regardless of uh, what I'm about to say. So case one, if my quark and any quark pair, the simple solutions that we looked at, if they're in causal contact, then um, they're entangled, but there's no wormhole. For instance, if I look at uh, global ADS, I can have a string that stretches so that one endpoint is on the north pole of the boundary sphere and the other point, um, endpoint is on the south pole. In that case, the string just sits there for all time nothing happens, but the quasi-particles are entangled. The other cases that are perhaps more interesting, the ones that we look at are where the quark and any quark are out of causal contact for all time. For instance, I can arrange a system where my quark and any quark accelerate uniformly away from each other for all time. So they come in, and then they go out. They're never in causal contact, they never talk to each other causally. In that case, what we find is that they're the, the dual string that encodes the physics of that pair has a wormhole on its world volume, or on its world sheet. And this is the sense in which we mean the, the title of the talk, that the dual of an EPR pair has a wormhole. The wormhole appears in the holographic dual on the string world sheet. And moreover, <coughs> what we can do, we can actually compute the, um, the entanglement entropy in this instance, say if I divide space in half, and so I look at the region, uh, I say I trace over half of space time, the region that contains the any quark. If I look at the region over here, I get the entanglement entropy, the leading correction to it from the string is some numbers for root lambda over three, and that's robust for a large class of trajectories where the any quark does all sorts of things over here. So what we conclude is that based on some logic that we elaborate on the paper is that this is really characterizing the entanglement of this quasi-particle with this quasi-particle. Someone, yeah. Let me go on since I don't have much time left. So this is, this is the picture actually for um, the, this example that I described where my quark and any quark accelerate uniformly. The red lines in this picture, this, this is a, 
picture in the boundary quantum field theory, the red lines indicate the world lines of the quark in any quark. And this is time going up, space going left and right as it should. Uh, these black lines, these are the world sheet horizons mapped up to the boundary. And these dotted lines, these are um, trajectories along the world sheet. If you imagine sending in some uh, light ray out of the string endpoint, this is the trajectory that it would travel if it was emanated at the time corresponding to the blue dot. And you can see that all the trajectories over here just don't come and talk to the other endpoint. So this is a wormhole that connects two causally disconnected regions of the world sheet. And this, incidentally, in the usual concrete hash coordinates, this is the embedding equation for this string. Let me point out that in order to calculate the entangled entropy in these configurations, you have to do a little more work. We had to uh, use a result that at the time had not appeared in the literature. Um, since then, it appeared in this uh, September paper with Andy O'Bannon. Uh, I'll just say a couple words about the calculation, because it's not terribly interesting, but I should tell you something. It's very similar in spirit to uh, a paper a couple of years ago by Cassini, Marta, and Myers in 2011. What they did was they related the calculation of certain entanglement entities uh, in conformal field theory to the calculation of certain thermal entropies of the same conformal field theory, but on some non-trivial background. In particular, they relate the spherical entanglement entropy to the thermal entropy of the same theory on the hyperbolic space at some temperature that's correlated with the radius of the hyperbolic space and in turn with the radius of the sphere, CFT. And they just use symmetry arguments to show that these things are true. Now, both of these problems, the spherical entanglement entropy and continuum field theory, as well as the thermal entropy on the curved background are both a priori very difficult problems by conventional field theory techniques. And so it seems that by mapping this to this, you haven't really gained anything. However, a thermal entropy on a interesting background, that's a question that EDS CFT is almost designed to calculate for you. In that case, there's some dual or hyperbolic horizon you calculate its area, and via Beckinski Hawking, you get the thermal entropy of the dual field theory. Well, one, one can suitably generalize this for conformal field theories with defects of various codimensions, assuming that the defect preserves some subgroup of the conformal symmetry. And then the final step is that you, you can regard the quark, this external quark, and an external antiquark as a conformal defect. So that allows us to compute the entanglement entropy from a thermal entropy, which is pretty easy to do. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, this will be, I guess, one of the last statements that I make, that I'll make, and then I'll finish the talk. Um, let me go back to a statement I made in the EPR section, where I said that entanglement, at least in quantum theories, where we know that there are no hidden variables, is signaled by connected space-like correlations. And I've told you how this works for, say, global um, large black holes and global ADS. Let me show you how it works here. Uh, if I have any connected string, endpoint here, endpoint here, everything else in between, then there are necessarily space-like trajectories along the string that connect one endpoint to the other, even when the two endpoints are space-like separated. In other words, these sorts of uh, space-like separated correlations always exist when the bulk has a connected string. This is, if you will, another way of seeing that if I have the connected string, that the two quasi particles are entangled with each other. For strings with world sheet horizons, um, well, in, in order to, to still have these correlations between the endpoints, you see that the, the, if there's two horizons, that they would have to, there would have to be string in between them that would allow you to still have these trajectories. In other words, to in other words, the story here works exactly the same way as it did for a two-sided black hole. You get order root lambda entanglement, and then you can also show that you get order root lambda space-like correlations between two quasi particles. There's actually a, a nice relation to the story I told you earlier about black hole pair production. Uh, Julian Sonner, just a couple weeks after our paper came out, 
uh, showed that the expanding string, it, it's actually the Lorentzian continuation of a Euclidean solution, which describes a, an external quark going in a circle, or if you will, a circular Wilson line from the point of view of the field theory. And as a result, you can interpret it as being the Schwinger pair production of QQ bar pairs, external QQ bar pairs. In this, so that is to say, this is completely analogous to the black hole pair production example that Malvasina and Susskind resurrect. There's also been a very nice recent paper uh, by Chernikov, uh, Guyosa, and Pedraza. I don't have time to talk about it. What they show, is, so the, example, the solutions that we looked at, um, it was crucial for us, since we studied very simple, very naive solutions, to get a wormhole once the my quasi particles were out of causal contact. What they show is that that's not a necessary condition. However, it is sufficient. Actually, there. So let me summarize and conclude so you guys can all go and have a nice rest of your day. Um, Malvasena and Suskin have recently made a, a really ambitious conjecture that the physics of wormholes is, in some sense, uh, geometrizing physics of entanglement based largely on looking at cold black holes. They make a conjecture more broadly. Um, one can test this completely independent of information laws, black hole firewalls, blah, 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 um, on concrete terms and holography, just using some objects that we know, like dual strings. Moreover, one can characterize the entanglement or the existence of the wormhole through these, uh, these space-like separated correlations. These are very nice. And um, there's a lot of things to do, actually. And I'm sorry, there's still, even though this is, these papers have been out, now the Zane and Susskin came out in June, there really hasn't been that much work on it in the context of ABS-CFT. So let me encourage you that there's a lot to do. Uh, in particular, with the strings, one might hope that the simple toy model offers a lot of, well, fruitful ground for future work. So maybe it offers you toy models for horizon formation on the, the world volume of the string, maybe even firewalls. Um, you can study strings in ABS, even at finite n, away from the strict Maldusena limits by studying quantum field theories with Wilson loops in them. And there are certain techniques that allow you to do this using supersymmetry at finite n. So maybe one can learn something about the bulk uh, on, the, on the strings at finite n as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. So string breaking for us, just to, so there's two questions at play. One is, can there be an effect? And two, why didn't I discuss it? So the answer to the second one is easier. Uh, the reason why I didn't discuss it, string breaking is suppressed by a factor of the string coupling. Okay. It's down by GS, which in these limits is like one over N. So it's down from all the processes that I consider by some parametrically huge amount. Okay. Even what about string breaking? That's also suppressed right, by right, GS, right. Yeah, by GS. Because, I mean, the, your quantum mechanical, or your quantum field theory analog is in this q q bar pair. That's Physically, right. it's going to break the string and we're going to form more and more mesons. And that's, well, that's, okay. that's, that, that's, that's the naive picture that one gets from QCD. Yeah. That's right. Um, it's actually kind of funny in this instance. I know that can't happen for reasons I didn't want to go into because they're not that important for the talk. The QCD thing doesn't happen or, or your thing? The, this, this string will actually won't break for the following reason. Well, yeah. okay, it, it's not going to break into a bunch of pairs in this yeah. way. Uh, it turns out that, so global, pop rate patch EDS is a coordinate restriction of global EDS. Okay. So one, one can get if you will, by studying um, using EDS T, studying field theory on a sphere, you can extract all the physics of um, the field theory in flat space in this way. And um, in 
the bulk, it's, you, it's just a patch of global ADS. It gives you uh, the usual ADS, whose boundary is R3, comma, 1. And the, the statement is that under that restriction, the string that I mentioned over there, the one that's just straight and doesn't, is just sitting there for all time, it actually maps to this one. Okay. So if I understand what's happening here, I don't think there's going to be string breaking and all these kinds of effects that you described, then I don't think it will show up here too. Now that being said, one could consider more general scenarios than the very special one that, that I'm looking at. And then it's, it is a question. Because then you know in physics that you actually, when you pull the two quarks apart, you are going to That's right. get this C of resonance. So you're not describing that. Well, no, it, it's, in, it's encoded through string breaking in the bulk. Yeah, and so those are 1 over NC corrections, and maybe there's some subtleties in that. Certainly, in finite, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things at finite end that should become very interesting. Um, that would be one of them. I guess, in that instance, Yeah, in that instance, you can, I mean, the, the resulting string fragments can still talk to each other. Yeah, the question is, does the string break before you form your wormhole? Well, so therefore, you have no wormhole formation because you just have a bunch of little strings. In it. Right. No, it's, it's true. The, what people, when people talk about wormholes or horizons, though, they're usually, how do say it, strictly speaking, a black hole horizon um, doesn't exist at finite end. It doesn't exist away from the strict semi-classical limit of quantum gravity. This is, um, and in the same way, a world sheet horizon, I think the resolution of this doesn't, strictly speaking, exist. So I think your question can be translated into another question, which is, what on earth do I mean by all of this away from the strict end goes to infinity limit? What does a wormhole look like? In for a black hole or for the world sheet? And that's a good question. I mean, Maldacena and Susskind, yeah. in their paper, they mumble some blah blah about trans and stuff, but I mean, really, no one knows. Are there any other questions? If not, let's 